Okay, so um, let me first of all, uh, you know, express my thanks to the organizers uh, for inviting me and to give me the opportunity to speak over here. Um, I was an organizer for a Park City program three years ago, so I have a good sense of how much, I mean, how complex it is to actually run this. Uh, so uh, what I want to do um, is to basically talk about some stuff which is very, very recent, and um, also some parts of it are still somehow tentative because it's, it's, it's sort of uh, work that's was just developed very recently. So the talk uh, is all joint work with my student, Vivian olsiuski healy who, who's uh, uh, moving to the University of Chicago in fall as a postdoc. And um, the talk basically includes some, some results from a thesis uh, and also some, some sort of more recent work. And uh, I would also like to kind of uh, acknowledge the help of Stefan Roder from the University of Washington. So somehow, uh, I mean, this was one of these things where once you got the right idea, everything is very smooth, but to actually get the right idea took a long time. And sort of a couple of weeks that uh, Vivian spent at Washington was very important. Okay, so, great. This thing is supposed to move. Hmm. Let's try this. Okay, so the, the talk is actually about uh, three pieces. So somehow two of them are classical probability. So Galton, Watson, Pro trees, which describe the genealogy of birth death processes. And, um, you know, that's a, a binary Galton, Watson tree. What I'm doing is, uh, you know, there's a mother, mother has uh, zero or two offspring, and it keeps going independently. And uh, the, the scaling limit of, of the Galton Watson trees, and more generally, scaling limit of, of uh, trees of this nature, was sort of understood in profound work by Aldous in the early 90s. And the scaling limit of these trees now you know, should, should really be considered very settled knowledge. And so, what I want to do is to somehow combine knowledge about sort of uh, Galton Watson trees uh, with the Lovner equation. So, what, I'm, what I want to do uh, okay, so the Lovner revolution is, is a sort of, let's say, canonical method of developing uh, conformal mappings. And this talk is really about somehow three questions, uh, one of the, which is completely nailed, one of them which is not quite nailed, uh, but somehow, uh, you know, we have a very good sense of what should come out, and the third one which is a little bit more tentative. So the first question is really, can we use the Lovner equation to construct natural graph embeddings of Galton Watson trees in the upper half plane? So what I want to do is I really want to find somehow natural way of building trees or building sort of conformal mappings which have the property of making trees. In particular, what I want to do is to actually understand the scaling limit of the object upstairs. And um, so the word graph embedding, so the CRT is actually a random metric space. And the graph embedding over here, somehow when we started out, what we really wanted was isometric embeddings. And that's not quite, uh, you know, our work doesn't quite achieve this. There is a notion of isometric embeddings, or something called conformally balanced trees. And uh, you know, at the end, I'll sort of introduce these ideas. So in some sense, uh, at first sight, it'll appear that there's nothing to do with random matrix theory. What I'm trying to do is just to build up these conformal mappings. But in fact, um, so Satya <laughs> Majumdar and I, uh, several years ago, organized uh, a meeting on random matrix theory in India at the time when I didn't know anything in, about random matrix theory. And so I was really turned on by sort of these amazing lectures that Jean Bernard Zuber gave at that, uh, at that meeting. And so somehow, you know, all of this work actually originates in that meeting about six years ago, seven years ago. So somehow there is random matrix theory over here, and it really comes about through the connection between map enumeration and matrix integrals. Okay, so uh, the, the talk basically, the, there's a little bit of background that I have to do because this is a very diverse audience and, you know, I feel Heston speaking about uh, other people's work, uh, but, but uh, you know, this is truly necessary. And there are these beautiful, uh, several beautiful papers uh, by Legal which basically describe the CRT. So I want to introduce you to the CRT. I want to introduce you to the Lovner revolution. And then I'll tell you, in some sense, what's our central result and our central conjecture, which is that we find this new stochastic PDE. Uh, and the stochastic PDE uh, sort of connects very nicely with, with random matrix theory. And finally, I'll conclude with some remarks on sort of the motivation that started, out, started us out. OK, so uh, what's a plane tree? It's a rooted combinatorial tree for which the edges are assigned a cyclic order about each vertex. And um, uh, the standard way of taking scaling limits of such trees is to actually look at their contour functions. So you take the tree, uh, 
and you build from the contour function an excursion, and you can go backwards. So, so trees uh, of this nature are in bijective correspondence uh, with such excursions. Oh, come on. This thing seems to keep... Ah, okay, sorry. It's just a time delay. Okay, so uh, the, the, the trees over here are really uh, discrete geometric objects, but somehow to, to take their scaling limits, what we really do is to, to sort of extend them uh, to, let's say, the continuous setting. And so a real tree is a pointed compact metric space with the tree property. It's a little bit hard to absorb at first sight, but somehow there's a very intuitive way of thinking about it. And the way you think about it is that you imagine that you have an excursion as above, and what you do is you use this excursion to introduce an equivalence relation on the interval 0, 1. So uh, given, a, given an excursion with uh, f0 is equal to f1 is 0, an excursion means that it's positive everywhere in between. What you do is you use a distance function. So for example, the distance between these two points over here is defined by the values of the function of these two points and then the min in between. And the equivalence relation is that two points are identical if the distance between them is zero. Okay, so, uh, you know, uh, we define, so given an excursion of this nature, we define a sort of quotient set of zero, one, and uh, we define the t the tree TF to be the real tree coded by F. Okay, so the continuum random tree uh, introduced by Aldous is, is the random real tree coded by the normalized Brownian excursion. Okay, so, uh, so somehow this is a natural scaling limit because when you look at um, the uniform distribution on rescaled dig parts of length 2n, then this converges uh, to the CRT. Okay, so the CRT was introduced by Aldous in, in 93. So, so, so somehow this is the framework in which you want to think about taking, uh, taking scaling limits of trees. So what we want are these branch structures in the complex plane, and we really want to be in a framework where we can take continuum limits of these branch structures. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about Levner uh, theory. So uh, the <laughs> I expect some of you have seen it, but uh, the Levner evolution is, is sort of a, a constructive way of building up uh, conformal mappings. And the, the standard way in which it's presented is that you're usually given, um, let's say, a, a, a simple curve in the upper half plane. And what you want to do is you sort of want to build up a family of conformal mappings of this simple, of this region with the simple curve in there, uh, mapping it to the upper half plane by gradually wiping out the curve upstairs. Okay, so the Riemann mapping theorem temp implies that for each t, there's, there's a unique conformal mapping which maps this region, so the, the, you know, the portion of the curve, um, the upper half space minus the portion of the curve over there onto the upper half space. And uh, in order to get uniqueness, you basically normalize at infinity. So that's a standard normalization in this business. For some reason, it's called the hydrodynamic normalization. And that number up there is something called the half-plane capacity. Okay, the real point is that uh, there is a constructive way of building these mappings. So somehow, if you know the, the, the value of the boundary value over there, u of t, then if you solve this initial value problem, you get uh, the conformal mapping. So uh, the Lovner, I mean, uh, this is uh, the first sort of proof of the Riemann mapping theorem. Uh, you know, was developed, I think, Gobe did it in, 19, in 1905. And Lovner, um, was interested, so, so, so sort of Lovner sort of found, let's say, continuous time description uh, of, of, of Kirby's theorem. And uh, what Lovner was really interested in is sort of resolving the you know, questions from univalent function theory. In particular, you know, he's the one who made the Bieber-Buck conjecture famous. Now, it turns out um, that there's a general version of the Lovner evolution. You need not restrict yourself to slit mappings and you need not restrict yourself to just sort of a driving measure, which is one point. In fact, there's a general theory which says that if you have, I mean, if you have a, a family of Huglotz functions parameterized by a positive measure, then you can define a conformal mapping with it. Okay, so <laughs> what's, what's going to happen for us is that what we're going to do is we're going to try to make this curve be not a curve, but to be a tree. Okay, so all of my effort is going to be to describe this, this, this set, which is going to be a tree, and somehow what I need to do is I need to figure out what the measure that goes with it is. 
Now, uh, there's some very, very mild conditions to get this theory to work. So it turns out that you really need only that this measure, uh, that this family, that you have a family of non-negative Borel measures, and you just need continuity of these measures in some sort of very mild boundedness conditions. But there's, there's, a, there's, there's a sort of uh, a subtlety in terms of, you know, you need actually much finer properties of this measure to actually establish finer geometric properties of the conformal mapping. Okay, so the standard examples of the of of the Lovna measure uh, of the Lovna theory are the first one is just this sort of point measure that I showed you, something that derives a slit mapping, and uh, there's a sort of generalization of the slit mapping which is very very recent. So it's in a it's in a thesis um, just a few years ago, and the real issue over here is the following. So the issue is uh, is related to the following. So if you go back to to this theory, so you know, you can generate a family of of conformal mappings only if this you know provided this measure is just weakly continuous. So it's sort of like you can find solutions to the Lovna PDE, and these solutions will actually define conformal mappings. All you require is that this measure is continuous. Now, the catch is that what you really want is you want to be able to say something about the geometry of the hull. Okay. And here it turns out that you need not just continuity, but you need sort of Helder continuity. So the, the, the basic condition, which is found by Marshall and Rota, is that these guys must be Helder one half. And uh, as, as many of you have probably seen, uh, somehow there's driving measures which are not well held a one half. So this, these are the sort of celebrated Schramm Lovner evolution, so SLE kappa. And in these cases, depending upon what kappa is, you get sort of completely different geometric properties of the hull. And that's really at a threshold. So you need held a one half to, to get the Lovner evolution. Brownian motion is not held a one half, but still you can work. And somehow what happens is that the constant in front becomes, becomes critical. So the question that we are really interested in is really the following. So which measures will generate embeddings of trees? And how will we sort of, how can we get sort of continuum limits of this? Okay, so the, the general form of Lovenar evolution, so this full measure is rarely used. So one of these is, it's, it's a historical thing. So what Lovenar was introduced, was interested in was the, the biba webb conjecture, and for that it was enough to look at slip mappings. The other one is somehow in conformal mapping theories, it's known that slit mappings are enough in the sense that every conformal mapping can be obtained as a, theory, as a limit in the Kara theory topology of slit mappings. So that's actually bad news in the sense that it says that you know, the, the continuity properties of, of Lovner evolution are very weak if you look at geometric properties of the hull. So you have to be far, far more careful than that. Okay, so there's a one-line summary of our work. Okay, the one-line summary of our work is the following. Uh, I'm going to claim that graph embeddings of continuum trees are generated by Lovner evolution when the driving measure turns out to being a suitable superprocess. Okay, so this is a measure-valued Markov process. Um, these were, you know, introduced, for example, I mean, these were studied extensively in connection, in fact, with continuum trees. Um, and it'll turn out, you know, I'm going to give you an example of the simplest sort of superprocess in our class. And this is something that we call the Dyson superprocess. So the reason we chose the name is the following. So, you know, there's something called the dawson watanabe superprocess. Uh, it's also sometimes called super Brownian motion. And so, you know, we played with either calling it the Dyson superprocess or calling it super free probability or super free Brownian motion. But somehow, you know, I think, I think this name works better. Okay, so to, to, to kind of tell you where this is coming from, I'm going to show you uh, a short movie. Okay, so here we are. Okay, so this should start. Okay, so this is a Lovner evolution which is actually driven by a Dyson Brownian motion with branching. And um, this is kind of a striking movie that uh, Vivian sort of uh, did after she came back from her, her stay at Washington. And this is when I became convinced that uh, you know, what we were doing was actually very interesting. So what's, what's going on in this picture? So there's sort of the pure, let, let me call it the pure combinatorics. Yeah, sure. So, so what I have uh, is is just a, a, a binary. So this is just a Galton Watson tree, where I'm going to develop a Galton Watson tree in continuous time. So. 
you know, mother has two children. Each of these children live for a random amount of time. And then um, these guys could either branch or they could die, again, at random times. Let's see. I have something like this. OK. And so what's going on in that picture is so somehow this is just this is you know, an abstract sort of combinatorial object with a time axis over here. OK, so this is the genealogy of a branching process. And what I'm really doing is I'm going to use the genealogy to obtain a driving measure. OK, so this is going to be uh, really something with, with spatial structure. So over here, I have uh, space x. And what I do is that associated to each of these points, so somehow what I'm going to do, so at time 0, when the mother has two children, I put down you know, two points over there at, at, let's say, 0 to be concrete. And then what happens is that these guys will evolve by dyson brown in motion. Okay, so then at the first branching time, this, this guy dies. And then over here, there's two offspring. OK, so there's, there's a, a pure genealogy part over here, and then there's a spatial motion. OK, and so, you know, in that picture, so it turns out actually, and so this, the spatial measure over here is what I call mu t dx. And then this guy drives. OK, so is this clear? This, this is the basic approximation. So there's the Lovno revolution, which is this machine for generating conformal mappings. What has to go into this machine is some sort of spatial motion or some sort of measure. And what I would do is I use a, I use a, branching, a branching process to actually drive this measure. OK, so uh, the, the, the key fact over here, and this is sort of like it's a pure conformal mapping theorem, uh, pure conformal mapping theory fact that took us a little while to figure out, is that somehow Dyson Brownian motion is just right to actually get the Lovner revolution to branch. So it's not obvious that the hull over there is actually going to branch. So people had tried to do this, and somehow it turns out that you have to have exactly the right interaction. And it turns out that sort of the 1 over x repulsion of Dyson Brownian motion or Coulomb propulsion is exactly the right thing, so that the hull itself has a branching property. Yeah. Oh, so here, at each spatial time, the equation for these guys. Okay, so. So over here, I have so it's sort of it, it's sort of look, let me put it this way: it's Dyson Brownian motion on these time intervals. So I have the genealogy, so there's a time axis over here. So initially, I'm starting out, I'm starting out always at sort of a singular point, where I have two points sitting on the boundary of the simplex. And then I move forward. So somehow, think about it as being Dyson Brownian motion on time slices. So at any time slice over here, so on. So I have a bunch of time intervals. These are given by the branching process. Let's see, dxi. Let me not put in any scaling factors. OK, and these must be continuous across. And then I'm setting Sorry? 
Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But somehow what happens is that I have these branch times, and at these branch times, either remove or put in a particle, and so it does matter that I have... Uh, and in fact, it'll turn out in the end, actually, <laughs> I should be a little bit more careful. So this is the prettiest picture, but it turns out that what we really do in order to prove our theorems, it's at this stage, we're still just doing pure repulsion, but we're going to be in the scaling limit where we're doing a law of large numbers, so this guy is actually going to vanish. Okay, so the, 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 the sort of super, the standard dawson watanabe uh, super process basically comes about in the following way. You again imagine that you have the same genealogy, and you have a bunch of particles, but these particles execute independent Brownian motions. Okay, so uh, what you're interested in is a situation where the, 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 the time steps over here become shorter and shorter, so you have more and more branching, but then you're looking at the continuous the continuous <coughs> uh, state branching process limits, so somehow the number of particles that you start with gets larger and larger. So the, the main claim, actually, is that somehow there's a, there's a nice scaling limit. Okay, now, you know, this is part rigorous, part formal. And the scaling limit is actually, uh, at least formally, okay, let me, let me come back to that issue in a couple of slides, described by the following stochastic BD. So I'm just going to write this out because it's going to come up okay so um so this over here is space time white noise. Okay, so let me just, you know, be again explicit. This is just a formal SPD. So what I'm trying to do is, you know, in, you know take a scaling limit where I'm taking, like, you know, you want to imagine this, this picture being sort of zoomed in to the kind of picture I was presenting with my numerics and then somehow taking the limit where I have infinitely many particles. And um, so the way I want you to think about this equation is, is as follows. In some sense, the way you want to think about it is just by, let's say, analogy, with the, with the super Brownian motion or with the Dawson Watanabe's super process. And so the Dawson Watanabe super process is the scaling limit of branching Brownian motion when the discrete branching processes converge to the Feller diffusion. And in that, in that problem, somehow the spatial motion of each particle is independent. And so this, this sort of, it's described by this SPD, at least formally. And the SPD has two pieces. So one piece is pure sort of linear evolution, so it's a sort of linear evolution given to you by the heat equation. And there's a second piece, which is the sort of the branching piece, uh, which is where the noise comes in. In both of these problems, sigma is just a fixed parameter, positive parameter. So <laughs> somehow uh, the PD that I'm writing down, so you want to see the left-hand side over here as being, you know, I think this goes back to an early paper of Voiculescu. You want to think about the left-hand side over here as being the sort of free probability analog of the heat equation. So what you're doing is you've got a linear operator, which basically gives you uh, the, the, the free convolution uh, with the semicircle law. And on the right-hand side, somehow you have this, this noise term. Okay? Okay. <laughs> what is what? Oh, sorry, this is the Hilbert transform. Okay. Okay, so uh, somehow the, uh, the, there's, a, there's a sort of very important difference with, with Dawson Watanabe. So in Dawson Watanabe, you've really got in particles doing their own spatial motion. But for us, really, the particles are interacting. Okay, and it's a very singular interaction. So it turns out that this is actually not covered by, let's say, standard theorems of, of Perkins and, and people like that. Okay, so let me give you sort of another way of thinking about this. So, so somehow uh, a very natural way of thinking about um, uh, you know, the evolution of measures on the line is instead to think about the Cauchy transform. And what I'm going to do is, so somehow our basic object is always this sort of measure which is randomly evolving, which is driving the Levner evolution. And so based on this measure, I'm actually going to build uh, a family of Gaussian analytic functions, you know, with a Bergman-type kernel for their covariance. Okay, so, the, so somehow the, the following form, it's sort of like, you know, an equivalent form of this PDE, instead of writing out a PDE for, 
uh, the density, let's write out, let's see what happens in the upper, upper half plane. And so I'm just taking the transform of that PD, and what happens is that I get, now truly I get an analytic function in the upper half plane, and I just have uh, a noise term, which is, uh, which is just the sort of Brownian motion in time. And this PD I can actually think about, you know, just solving by the method of characteristics. Okay, so what I'm really doing, so the left-hand side over here, you, you want to think about this is just the equation that shows up in free probability theory. It's just the equation that describes evolution by semicircular law. But what I'm doing is I'm pushing this. I'm pushing this with this sort of, this field, which is again determined back again uh, by the row. And it turns out that somehow this is intimately coupled with the Lovner revolution. So a very clean way of actually writing out Lovner's PDE is finally just through this ODE. Okay, so there's this coupling between these two. So it, it sort of fits very cleanly. Uh, that's kind of what I'm trying to convey over here. Ah, H. So H is this sort of Gaussian analytic, fun this Gaussian analytic function, uh, which is obtained again from the measure. Okay, so this is... So <laughs> Give me a sec. Somebody can ask a question while I'm figuring this out. <laughs> okay, so you, you see what I'm, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to find what should be the right limit equation for sort of embedding trees into the upper half plane. Okay, continuum trees. And uh, now let me just sort of comment on this aspect of the stuff being formal. So it turns out there's a sort of this key technical aspect that we can't prove right now. And um, you know, I was really hoping I would have it by the time we came here, but we don't. The issue is whether you know, there actually is a density. Does this SPD actually make sense or not? And so this, this turns out to being an interesting question in the case of already the dawson watanabe superprocess. And over there, it's known that you, know, there's a, there's a, you, know, you have a measure, you don't have a measure, depending upon the space dimension. So it turns out that when the space dimension is one, uh, you, you truly do have a measure uh, for the dawson watanabe process as a result of Kono and Shiga from, from 88. Uh, on the other hand, in dimensions greater than or equal to two, it's actually known that this measure mu is singular. Okay, so we don't actually know what the answer should be, and it sort of comes down to how you think about this SPD. So somehow, if I time step, so you know, I do dt rho plus dx. So if I imagine sort of solving just this PD, this actually is smoothing. Okay, in the following sense that if you start out with, let's say, some measure. You know, it could be singular. Let's say you've got two atoms, so let's say this is... So, you know, I, I'm, I'm always using... You know, I want to know if I've got a density or not. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm looking at the free convolution. So if I look at, and let me say mu t is equal to nu t. This is free. So this is, let's say, semicircle. Okay, so uh, sort of a very basic result of, of Beyond says that you know if you just go up a little bit in time, then what's going to happen is that these guys are basically going to become like semicircles. And what what Bian actually gives is he sort of gives an infinity estimate, which tells you how the the density of the measure. So it's something like so the sort of Beyond's estimate goes. Okay, let me write it out. So it's, it turns out that there's a, the following sort of estimate, rho squared. Right, so it's something like this. It's less than or equal to, I think it's one over t squared. So I think this is. So <laughs> somehow what happens is that if you think about this equation, so if I drop, if I have zero over here, what I have is a kind of smoothing term. On the other hand, what I'm doing is I'm sort of adding in fluctuations. So the fluctuations are kind of roughening the measure, and the, and the sort of free convolution is smoothing in. And I actually don't know how this balances. 
And it turns out this is absolutely critical because for the sort of way we are formulating this, pr this problem to have any, any sort of uh, a meaning, what we actually need is that this measure should not have a density. The reason I want this measure not to have a density is, let me go back to the very start. What I want to do is I want to solve Lovnor evolution. And somehow, uh, this is Lovnor evolution with this measure. What, what turns out is that the measure is sort of supported on points that are escaping the upper half plane. So what I, what I want is that I want the set of points. So what I want is I want a tree to be built up. And in order to have this tree to be built up, I need it really to be sort of driven by a singular measure, which is spread out in some place. And we don't have the estimates. OK, so that, that's sort of, the, that's sort of the, the analytical picture, or the, that's a, let's say the conceptual picture. That was supposed to be more or less the introduction. But anyway, let me tell you more precisely what we can prove, what, the, what, what goes into this proof, and somehow how this actually sheds light on certain other problems. Okay, so is, is what, I'm, what I'm doing clear? So what I'm trying to do is I'm actually trying to formulate somehow what should be the candidate driving measure for embeddings of trees, of these continuous trees. Now these continuous trees are kind of singular objects, and so it turns out that the measure I need has to also be a singular object, and the singular object, so this measure is actually described as a solution to an SPD. So that's kind of the way the pieces fit together, okay? So let me, let me actually tell you what we can prove uh, rigorously somehow, you know, just at the outset. So there's two pieces. So one is a conformal mapping piece, which basically says that the, the square root interaction or the square root to t scaling of Lovner revolution is basically perfectly matched with the kind of square root t singularity in Dyson Brownian motion. So that's just a sort of deterministic fact about Lovner revolution. And what I will next tell you is somehow what we can actually prove about the SPD. So roughly speaking, what we can prove is that, um, you know, that, that our sequence of approximations is tight, and the limits of the sequence actually solve not quite this SPD, but a Martingale problem that goes with it. Uh, and so you know, somehow this picture is consistent, even if it's not fully nailed down. OK, so um, uh, Let's see. Okay, I mean, let me let me tell you about the conformal mapping piece. So this is this is really one of the theorems uh, proven by Vivian, and it's actually it's got nothing to do with Dyson Brownian motion. It's got nothing to do with probability. It's really the following fact: How do you make a Lovner revolution which has the property of splitting splitting particles into into branches? Okay, and um, the the way uh, we'll do it is somehow by by thinking about a Lovner revolution, which is driven by a bunch of points. And I'm going to ask for a sort of singular initial condition. So I, I'm going to take n continuous functions, okay, each of which are mutually non-intersecting, and uh, except for sort of one index at which these two guys are the same. So I'm going to ask myself, you know, what's the, so I've got two points over there, and I have a, a double point over here, and I want to know how the Lovner revolution works with that. So, let me, let me not give you the detailed der derivation of here. What we are trying to do is we're sort of trying to understand, so this is really a pure conformal mapping piece. What we are trying to understand is sort of 